It's not every day you bankrupt the oldest bank in the UK. But in the mid-90s, Nick Leeson did just that. After being appointed to a high-level position within Barings Bank, Leeson developed a nasty habit of losing his employer's money through bad trades. He then just covered up his mistakes. This worked for a little while, but can anyone secretly cover up a mind-boggling $1.3 billion loss? Leeson came from humble beginnings. Not only was he born to a working class, family in Hertfordshire, England, he didn't excel at school either. He coasted academically, mainly earning C's and D's, even failing his mathematics course. He didn't go to college and didn't have much going for him as he ventured into adult life. In 1985, he did what anyone who's terrible at math would do. He got a job at a bank, the London branch of the well-respected Coots & Co Bank, to be exact. Though he was just a lowly clerk at this point, Leeson's gig at Coots was a necessary first step into the world of banking. It set him down a career path that would eventually lead to the billion dollar crimes of his future. Before he even dreamed of handling that much money though, he was overseeing more modest transactions, processing customers' deposits, settling their checks, all that fun stuff. With a couple of years of bank experience under his belt, Leeson moved to Futures and Options back office of Morgan Stanley in 1987. He parlayed that position into an opportunity to join Barings Bank two years later. He still hadn't been able to crack the coveted front office, but he was now working for the United Kingdom's oldest in investment bank. His initial involvement with Bearings was as a clerk, making a meager £12,000 a year. His hard work and loyalty soon paid off. He was given more and more responsibility as time went on and was sent abroad to troubleshoot Bearings' office in Indonesia. In 1991, after returning to London, he was tasked with investigating a Bearings employee suspected of perpetrating financial fraud through a client's account. Leeson successfully uncovered the scheme, and a few months later, he was entrusted with the biggest assignment of his career thus far. Bearings Bank opened a Futures and Options Office in Singapore in April of 1992. Because they were so cripplingly short-staffed, they decided to name Leeson the general manager in charge of heading up their entire Singapore operation. In this post, Leeson would eventually carry out the billion-dollar fraud that rocked the United Kingdom to its core. Leeson's scam is like no other because of the historical significance of Baring's Bank. It was first founded in 1762 by Sir Francis Baring, who ran the bank into the 19th century. They started as a wool trade firm, as that was the Bering family business. As the years went on, they expanded their services to accommodate the ongoing evolution of international trade. In 1802, they got involved in the largest land acquisition in history when they helped facilitate the Louisiana Purchase. Even though the Bearings were technically British aristocrats and the UK was currently at war with Napoleonic French, the Bearings worked directly alongside Napoleon Bonaparte himself in the legendary transaction. They sold the Louisiana territory to the United States on behalf of the French leader, which in turn helped bankroll France's military efforts against the British. You may think the Bearings' actions as treacherous, but all's fair in love and war, right? Besides, they're businessmen, and they were simply making a business transaction. One of the most historically significant business transactions of all time at that. By the time our friend Nick Leeson entered the picture in the early 90s, Bearings Bank had already cemented its place in the history books and was the oldest UK merchant bank still standing. No way a small-time banker who flunked out of math was going to mess that up. Leeson began as a lowly clerk with Bearings, but worked his way up to oversee Bearings' day-to-day -day activities in Singapore. He was given this prestigious position despite being denied a broker's license in London because of some inconsistencies in his application. That's the nice way of saying it anyway. In reality, he committed fraud. He neglected to report a judgment that had been made against him previously by National Westminster Bank. Both Leeson and Bearing itself chose not to mention that little detail when he applied for his license in Singapore, which he received. He was already a fraudster before he ever made his first trade, but even so, he was entrusted with an entire division of the bank. At first, it seemed Bering's risky appointment of Leeson was paying off, reporting massive profits for the Singapore office. In 1994 alone, he made somewhere between 20 and $35 million for the bank through his trading. Despite his difficulty with arithmetic, it appeared that he was something of a natural when it came to stock trading. That £12,000 salary he had started out with had ballooned into the hundreds of thousands, not to mention the millions and bonuses he was bringing in as well. Now that he was making the big bucks, Leeson was making sure to live it up in Singapore. He lived in a beautiful three-bedroom apartment with his wife and live-in maid and spent many of his nights out, partying and drinking until he was blue in the face. Harry's Bar was a particular favorite of his and his drinking buddy. Their wild nights out had earned them something of a reputation and Leeson was even arrested on one occasion for mooning a group of waitresses. His rowdy evenings often bled into the next morning. He regularly showed up to work hungover 
and with cuts and bruises on his face from fist fights he got in too. But when it was time to work, Leeson buckled down and worked, making the firm millions of dollars in the process. Or so it seemed. While Leeson and his crew recorded tremendous figures on their official reports, they were fudging those numbers a bit. Or rather, a lot. It began after one of Leeson's underlings made a simple but crucial mistake. It was a particularly hectic day on the stock exchange floor in Singapore. A bearing's assistant accidentally sold her customer shares instead of buying more. Leeson noticed the inconsistency in their numbers and brought it to his supervisor's attention. His boss sent him off to fire the careless trader who had mishandled the transaction. But that never actually happened. Instead of sacking the employee, Leeson decided to sweep the error under the rug by logging it into error account 88888, so named because the number 8 represents good fortune in Chinese culture. The error account was originally opened at the request of Baring's London office. They wanted Leeson to use it to keep track of trading discrepancies that weren't significant enough to bother the main office with. This wasn't exactly a trivial mistake, however. The assistant's blunder would cost the bank tens of thousands of dollars to rectify. But instead of dealing with all that, Leeson snapped his fingers and made it all disappear, at least for the time being. The bleeding cash didn't stop after that one slip-up. Leeson started operating as a rogue trader, someone who is authorized to make trades on behalf of their clients, but uses their position of authority to make unauthorized trades. At first, Leeson was just trying to make up for the money they had lost by performing off-the-books trades to earn extra cash. Unfortunately, this only exasperated the problem. His reckless gambling dug the hole deeper, and the error account was now full of losses and mistakes that Leeson was desperately trying to keep secret from bearings. He wasn't exactly making safe bets either. These were Hail Mary attempts to get the bank's money back. Essentially, Leeson had taken his employees' cash to Vegas and was hoping for the best. The error account's losses were piling up at this point, thanks to Leeson's doubling strategy, which doubled the amount of money lost each time he made a bad trade. This aggressive plan of action allowed him to recoup a £6 million loss at one point in 1993, but it wasn't long before the negative balance sheets came back. By the end of 1994, the rogue trader had gambled his way into $250 million worth of debt in the form of unresolved mistakes in his error account. Account 88888 had given Leeson the perfect opportunity to cover up his failings thus far, but the massive losses were becoming too big to ignore. To the outside world, he was a superstar, making his company millions of dollars a year off the back of his genius trades. In reality, he was nothing more than a fraud who was digging himself deeper into the hole and refused to put down the shovel. The final nail in the coffin came in early 1995 when the Great Hanshin earthquake struck Kobe, Japan. How did a natural disaster in another country prove his ultimate demise? Well, in late 1994, Leeson had formulated a plan to start making a dent in his air accounts losses. He placed a futures bet that the Japanese stock market would remain above 19,000 in March of 1995. Under any normal circumstances, this was a fairly safe gamble. But after the earthquake in Japan caused the market to drop 7%, Leeson lost and he lost big. In one day, he squandered $75 million from his bet on Japan, and to make matters worse, he tried to get it all back by making a bet on the Japanese market's comeback. When that never materialized, he lost hundreds of millions more, and his luck had pretty much run out completely. He and his wife went on the run, fleeing Singapore for a resort on the sun-soaked shores of Borneo. He didn't leave without saying goodbye, of course. On his desk, he left a handwritten note that simply read, I'm sorry. Not exactly the resounding apology the bank was looking for, as they were ultimately declared insolvent in late February. Leeson had already disappeared into the wind at that point, leaving behind a whopping $1.3 billion in unresolved losses. Leeson's time as the world's most wanted financial fugitive was brief, lasting less than a week. He bought a plane ticket using his real name, making it easy for authorities to track him down. That boneheaded mistake was simply the latest in the series of slip-ups that had gotten Leeson into a whole lot of trouble. After getting arrested in Germany, Leeson pleaded guilty to two counts of financial fraud and sentenced to six and a half years in a Singapore prison. He was released after just four years due to his good behavior and a colon cancer diagnosis that predicted his imminent passing. Remarkably, he defied the odds and survived his bout with cancer. While still behind bars, he wrote a memoir titled Rogue Trader, which detailed the various criminal hijinks that led to Bearings' collapse from Leeson's perspective. The $700,000 advance Leeson received from the book went towards paying his considerable legal expenses. He used the book to tell his side of the story. In it, he swears up and down that he never took advantage of account 88888 for his gain and that it was 
solely used to cover up his team's mistakes. Investigators went on to find millions of dollars stashed in multiple bank accounts tied directly to Leeson, which certainly calls these claims into question. Either way, the book was a success, and in 1999, it was adapted into a feature film starring Ewan McGregor as Nick Leeson. Once the smoke settled on the whole situation, it was hard not to question Baring's bank itself and the role the firm played in allowing Leeson to perpetuate the enormous scam. Why did they keep supplying him millions and millions of dollars to do with whatever he pleased entirely unsupervised? Leeson himself has a theory on that subject. He believes the higher-ups at the bank simply didn't understand futures and options trading and therefore placed far too much power and authority in the hands of a man that they thought had a solid grasp on the industry. Whatever the reason for their unconditional trust in Leeson was, it ended up costing them big time, crumbling an operation that had been going strong for over 200 years. Nick Leeson has taken his second chance and ran with it. He earned a degree in psychology and found himself a new wife. He regularly makes appearances on the after-dinner lecture circuit, where he leads discussions on corporate management and how to take risks in business properly. He uses his life story to inform companies on how not to operate. He's also back on the market, buying and selling stocks like the old days. Thankfully, he's only using his own money this time around. Click here to watch one of these next videos.